online, so we thank you uh, for being here today, and thanks to all the folks who are uh, online with us. Uh, Bernie just introduced me as a, a guy who has been broadcasting for the Pittsburgh Pirates for close to 30 years, but uh, along the way, spending about 10 years in the Pittsburgh Pirates front office, I went to Youngstown, Ohio, and anchored for a year there on the NBC television affiliate, WFMJ. I went to Buffalo, New York to try and learn how to become a baseball broadcaster and along the way had opportunities to broadcast all sports and got a real big break when I broadcast Buffalo Bills football during their Super Bowl run. And I tell the story about my first year back in Pittsburgh in 1994. I came back for my first year as a pirate broadcaster. Now that was shortly after the Pirates had spent three consecutive years atop the then National League Eastern Division. They won three straight National League Eastern Division titles from 90, 91 to 92. Uh, I left after the 1989 season, so I was not there in Pittsburgh for that run. When I came back to the Pirates after my five-year stint in Buffalo, unfortunately the Pirates were not doing well. So three agents had left. In fact, uh, they were at the time of a baseball strike in early August, perhaps the team with the worst record in baseball. And the Pirates decided during that late summer that rather than have their announcers just sit idly by, that they would assign us to do various speaking engagements in the Western Pennsylvania area to try and keep baseball in the minds of the fans. And one of my very first speaking engagements as a Pirate broadcaster was at the Butler Country Club. And I have been there since, uh, this was again 1994, I've been there since, and I tell people that that big ballroom that I spoke at over a luncheon that day, I thought, seated 5,000 people, and they all laughed, and they said it seats 150 people. I said, well, when I spoke that day, it seemed like there were 5,000. So, uh, I was the featured speaker at the Butler Country Club this afternoon. The man who was introducing me that day was a former pirate superstar, Steve Blass, who to this day is a great friend of mine, and was a good friend then. And Steve got up there in front of, like I said, a crowd of what I looked to be 5,000 people, so I am nervous as all get out, as you can imagine. I'm the featured speaker, and he got up there, and his introduction to me was, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to a, a, a friend who's going to be our featured speaker. He left the Pittsburgh Pirates five years ago. The year after he left, the Pirates began winning a string of three consecutive National League Eastern Division titles. He proceeded to go to Buffalo, New York, where he announced the Buffalo Bills, at which time they lost four straight Super Bowls. Now he's back. The Pirates are in last place, and there's a baseball strike. Please welcome our good luck charm, Greg Brown. And you could have heard a pin drop. And as the years went on, I wondered whether there's something about this. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, I reminded people as the years and eventually, unfortunately, the decades went on as the Pirates lost, unfortunately, for 20 straight years. I was only a part of the last 19 consecutive years of losing. Thankfully, they broke that string, and in 2013, we went to the first of three consecutive wild cards. So, uh, have no fear. Uh, the Pirates are, are, are getting there, and, and it's not me. So, I'm... I'm I'm actually, I consider myself a good luck charm. I tell people that the, the Buffalo Bills didn't lose four straight Super Bowls. They won four consecutive AFC championships. Of course, despite that, people tell me that they've changed the spelling of Bills to four L's. The area code in Buffalo has been changed to 044. You can, I, I can laugh at it. You can too. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Those days are long gone. All right, anyway, I, uh, on my way from San Francisco the other night, we got in uh, late uh, yesterday morning, I guess it would be, uh, I, I just jotted some things down on my Samsung notes, and I asked that they, and it's no particular order, just kind of random thoughts that I had, and I thought I'd share these just with you. These are kind of basic things about broadcasting and play-by-play. And -play. I am old school. We uh, kidded about that moments ago with Dr. Green. I actually have a pen on my person, and I know that doesn't happen uh, very often anymore. But I write 
just about everything down. Of course, I have a computer, I've got a smartphone, I've got two iPads, but for me, writing things down, I, I've got a terrible memory, so writing things down, maybe through osmosis, helps me uh, remember things. So I have a gigantic scorebook. So that's one side of this huge scorebook of mine. I just randomly took this picture. Now, I don't know if anybody can understand anything there. Again, my partners laugh at me because they say, how can you understand that uh, chicken scratch? But uh, I believe that, that baseball and broadcasting in general, the, the number one idea when you go to a sporting event to be a broadcaster, first and foremost, your job is to describe the action as best as you possibly can. On radio, no detail is too small. On television, it's a different animal. On television, the pictures tell the words. So the play-by-play -play person, guy or gal, is almost, almost takes a back seat to the color analyst. Because obviously those pictures are telling the viewer what's going on. So you should talk way less on television. But uh, for time restraints that we have, we'll concentrate on radio. Since I think most uh, high schoolers, I'm not sure how many will have uh, television broadcast. Most will be radio. So usually when I prepare for a radio broadcast, I, my intent is to write down as much stuff as I can in case the game goes south. Because when you have a good game, well-paced, in any sport, as long as you don't mess it up as a broadcaster, it's still going to be a good game. That it should be your, your number one goal, is to do a solid broadcast by describing what's going on and not mess up a good game. Now there are times when the game does go south and you will have some idle time and so on. It's especially true in baseball where there is inconsistent pacing. In football and in basketball and in hockey, it's time. So you pretty much know going into any of those games, you won't have a lot of time for idle chatter. You basically will just describe the action. But in baseball, it's different. So uh, you may notice if you hear me on a broadcast, uh, on a radio broadcast, I may say, Trent Grisham leading off, left-handed hitter, the 24-year-old who was acquired by the Padres from Milwaukee along with Zach Davies in November of 2019. Here's the pitch, foul away. Chad Cool rubs up the baseball. Grisham was a first round pick in 2015. Here's the next pitch, it's foul away. It's 0 2 on Grisham, who came in 5 for 11, maybe 455 on the year, and so on. Just to have that available. Uh, Stephen Brault, there was an injury. This was uh, taken from last year. He had a lab injury. Uh, so Chad Cool is pitching, the first of 26, and just one of 26 pitchers who in the first inning uh, uh, overall throws first pitch strikes 33 of 72 times. Little things all along, and this frankly isn't even filled up. I mean, I, 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 when I went into this game, I'm thinking I didn't have enough time. I needed more time to fill this son of a gun up. Bob Walk has said to me, he told other people when they come to visit the radio booth, and they look at this and they go, what is this all about? And he said, I have looked at this over his shoulder and nine times out of 10 after a ball game, I'll see some nuggets or notes and I'll realize he never got to those. You never mentioned any of those. That's fine. You want to have them just in case. Uh, so I think that's just, that is my, everybody's got their own idiosyncrasies, their own, for me, it's a security blanket. I have to do this before every game. I have to use different colored pens. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I use a, one of those four colored ink pens. And uh, that is because when Chad Cole started, he went three and two thirds innings. You see that at the top. But I can right away see that Clay Holmes came in second, and I can right away find out exactly who faced Clay Holmes. And later, David Bednar. David Bednar picks the sixth inning. Chris Stratton. That helps me in post-game wrap-ups when we do highlights and so on. And I'll uh, highlight the three hit by pitches. Uh, that may come into play the next day. So all these things, uh, again, you'll develop either you or whoever you, you might hire someday or be with will 
will develop their very own um, idiosyncrasies or characteristics that will just help along the way and those are my as I say security blankets so I write down I use a lot of sticky notes uh, do we have the uh, the next slide with the you should just forward. forward there we are thank you so these are kind of my weapons uh, I use of course the sharpie the telex is for television the earpiece where you have sometimes I feel like a thousand people talking to you radio and television are so different uh, television you're one of a 25 piece orchestra and again you just hope not to mess it up radio it's you and your broadcast part uh, I use the, the multicolored pen there's the little sticky note pad I use those sticky notes like crazy I have a lot of people say hey would you say hello it's my son's fifth birthday he's gonna be at the ball game today what, what's his name I'm gonna write that down and put that sticky note on that score sheet and when I get to it people are ill pirate fans watching and I, I use those sticky notes all the time and anytime I, I make sure if I, ha if I have any left toward the end of the game I'll rapidly say happy birthday so-and-so get well so-and-so uh, because I think that's critically important because people are relying on you uh, they have you know there are a lot of people listen to Pirates baseball and uh, people love hearing their names what I still do if I'm on occasion I got a buddy uh, who we recently played the San Diego Padres and a good friend of mine is the color analyst on TV for, for the Padres, a former pitcher named Mark Grant. And he'll text me and he'll say, oh, you guys just beat the Giants, or your Giants just beat you, and I'll say something in return, and I'll head home listening to other games, and I'll listen to the Padre games, and if Mark Grant says my name, you know, Greg Brown's listening, I get excited. I think that's kind of neat. So people love hearing their names, and so that's, it's really important. Uh, I use the... Uh, I use those scissors because I cut and paste a lot of stuff. We get a lot of information, papers all over the place, statistics and notes and the like. And if time permitting, I go through each of the game information notes, statistics that might be applicable, uh, but they're, it's so cumbersome, I'll try and cut them and design them and, and put them at my space uh, or, or scotch tape them, as you see the scotch tape up against the wall so that I'm not constantly fidgeting through uh, papers, uh, a stapler, even a stapler, because we get so many loose papers and, and information, scouting reports, and that's how I kind of started the egg timer. That, now that is old school. That is really old school. When I was doing minor league baseball in Buffalo, New York, Pete Weber was the main play-by-play -play guy. He is now the voice of the Nashville Predators, had been there since they started. But Pete had that egg timer, and he'd flip it. Uh, I'm doing color, he's doing play-by-play -play on the radio, and he keep flipping it, and one day I said, what in the world is that egg timer for? And he said one of the early pioneers of broadcasting named Red Barber, who used to announce for the Brooklyn Dodgers, he always had that egg timer because one thing, a must in all of sports broadcasting, no matter the sport, on radio especially, you must give the score repeatedly because people will get on you if you if you're in a car this day and age oftentimes the score is displayed anyway but maybe you're you've got a, your earbuds and you're cutting the lawn or you're doing other things you're working out and you don't have a display and if and I know how frustrated I get when this happens and you're listening to a sporting event and that guy or gal does not give you the score pretty timely it's very frustrating not to know what that score is so he used that, and every time that sand runs out after um, 90 seconds, he tells the score and flips it over. And so I've had that. I have a bunch of them, uh, different colors actually, in case they break and so on. But quick story on that. I've always said this. You can criticize Greg Brown for anything you want. I know people don't like my style. He gets too excited about the Pirates. Uh, you know, he's too much of a homer. Anything you want to do, you can but you will never criticize Greg Brown for not giving the score enough because of that. I was determined that that was going to be the case with me. Until about eight years ago, I was driving home and I decided to turn on the post-game show, the Pirate post-game show. 
And it just so happened I turn it on and the host says, okay, we've got a call who has a complaint about Greg Brown. This is a post-game show to talk about the Pirates players, not, not Greg Brown. And I, and I almost came to a, a halt on the parkway. Uh, and I'm thinking, now what? What are they going to rip me for now? And he says, go ahead, what's, what's your problem with Greg? He says, yeah, he gives the score too much. <laughs> too much! So I guess my, my feeling is that you can't please everyone in sports broadcasting, so you kind of have to please yourself. There's an old song many years ago that called Garden Party, and I think if I sing it to myself, one of the refrains in that song is, you can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. And I think about that all the time, because you will get critics. And one of the notes I have on those sheets was you have to have thick skin. You have to have thick skin. You have to have a great belief in yourself, in, in doing play-by-play, -play, going on the air. You're exposing yourself. I'm a, I'm a private person. But man, once you hit that microphone, those days are gone. And people will, there's so much jealousy in this world, and there are a lot of people that want your jobs. You'll find that out once you get there. And the best way for people who can't get somewhere, rather than working hard to do what you do, the easy way out is to criticize. If you do television, you say less, of course. Uh, on television, you don't do play-by-play -play all the time. Uh, you try to understand, as I do anyway, that someone, you are talking to someone in a living room, one person. Never be overwhelmed by the audience. I have never said, good evening everybody, or hi everybody, or welcome back everybody. Uh, a long time talk show host, very successful here in Pittsburgh for 50 years. He was a morning DJ kind of guy. Did uh, easy listening music. His name was Jack Bogut. He was one of the most popular in the history of Pittsburgh. I heard him doing an interview one time, and they asked him, what is it that you connect with Pittsburghers, that you have a connection that no one else does? And he says, I've never assumed, and it's a great assumption, when someone goes on the air and says, hello, everybody, why do you assume that it's everybody, this overwhelming audience? So I've taken that to heart, and I try and speak to one person. Now, this person, for a long time, my mother passed away five years ago. I would talk to my mother. I have buddies who stop by local pubs and watch games. I talk to a buddy. I think about somebody cutting the grass. I think about a mom who's traveling with three kids to soccer practice and happens to flip on the game. I think about a kid. When I was a kid, I listened to games. I would lie down in bed late at night and listen to the games on the radio. So, uh, I, again, I, I don't listen, I don't consider myself talking to a vast audience. I consider talking to one person. I have a friend who has really helped me out, who uh, plays on the, uh, the Miracle League team. She's, she's, uh, she's uh, handicapped, she's blind, but she's a huge fan and she comes to a couple games a year and I bring her up to the press box and uh, we chat and she tells me, she keeps me straight about what I said or didn't say on the air because she can't see the games, but she listens all the time. And boy, is that helpful. If you realize that, not literally, but everyone you are broadcasting to on the radio is blind. Uh, so you have to describe for them, and that, that really keeps you going. Uh, it, days when I'm in Des Moines, Iowa, and the Buffalo Bisons are playing the Iowa Cubs, and there have been four rain delays, and there are three people at Sec Taylor Stadium uh, yelling, and you can hear everything they say, and it's uh, 1.30 in the morning in the east, and uh, this game is completely meaningless and out of hand, and well, you have to fight it. You have to really fight it and say, you know, I signed up for this, number one. This is what I love to do, but people still care. People are listening, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be as professional as I can and uh, at times you have to find ways to entertain. You have to, I have the out of town scoreboard for Major League Baseball. I don't know how important that would be, I guess during high school games, uh, as you approach the Whitfield playoffs and so on, people are really into it. So you can now have uh, the 
uh, computers at, at your ready that you can get other scores from other games uh, and provide details when necessary. I believe depending on your size of the crowd that you can let the game breathe. Uh, I chuckle at the late great Vin Scully, loved him, without question the greatest broadcaster in my lifetime, maybe in the history of broadcasting, which by the way began right here in Pittsburgh in 1921, so the great history here in this, this city, in this region. Uh, but he would always, and people praised him for not saying too much. That they talk about some great moments, including when Hank Aaron in 1974 break, he broke Babe Ruth's all time home run record in Atlanta, Georgia, number 715, in front of a sellout crowd in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. And he, he hits this momentous, epic home run, and the crowd is going ballistic. And then said home run and he talks about how he stepped out of his chair went back behind the booth took a sip of water and it was timed out that i think it was two minutes and 23 seconds of nothing but crowd noise which is great i love that but i also announced for the pittsburgh pirates and i know that the games in coming up in september if the pirates are out of it in the midweek i'm not stupid i know there are a couple thousand people in that stands, and if it's a game that's gotten out of hand and late, there might be 500. So, if somebody hits a home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates that makes it eight to two in the ninth inning with two outs, and I hear a couple people clapping, I'm a fool if I sit there and let them go back to the booth and take a drink of water for two minutes. Um, so you've got to you've got to know your audience. And that doesn't mean that you have to constantly talk. I do listen on occasion to other sports. I certainly listen to baseball during the summer. I try to take a break in the off season now. Uh, when, when baseball's done, I'll watch a couple half times, maybe a game or two of, of football. If I'm traveling, I might turn on the Steeler game. And I, I get frustrated uh, because, it, and especially in other sports, frankly, where Football, basketball, hockey, it is so fast paced that it, for me, it's, maybe it's all personal, but I spent some time as the broadcast coordinator for the Pittsburgh Pirates, so I feel like I, I know a little bit about the dynamics of play by play and so on. Um, I don't think it's necessary to every time a play by play guy stops talking, that the very split second he's done, bam! color analyst comes in there and describes bop, 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 bop. sometimes they have two color analysts in the booth and so multiply that you know 15 yard out he's tackled at the 25 yard line well this bop, 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 and then the third guy comes up and then bang snap boy oh boy let it breathe don't be afraid of natural sound and that's that goes I think with, with anything, with any, any level, uh, that also helps your pacing, especially if you're doing the game by yourself. Take advantage of those opportunities where you get great, great stories. Uh, I'll, I'll bypass the uh, monitor in front of the TV games. Promoting your team, no matter for whom you are broadcasting, be it a, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Penguins, uh, Elizabeth Forward High School, uh, Point Park. It does not matter. You are broadcasting for them. They have hired you. I cringe when I hear people say, oh, he's a homer for the Pittsburgh Pirates. No kidding. Really? Well, that's a genius statement. Of course I am. I broadcast 162 major league games for the Pittsburgh Pirates. They pay me a good amount of money. And I do 30 preseason games in Bradenton, Florida. I live in Bradenton, Florida for seven weeks thanks to the Pittsburgh Pirates. You're darn right I'm a homer for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And proud of it. 
Uh, so I will never, ever apologize for that, nor should you, because the people that pay you or hire you are doing it for a reason. They want you to go on the air, they should, they should hire you to broadcast the game as professionally as you can. But a friend of mine, who was my boss at the Pirates, became the vice president of broadcasting for the Chicago Bulls for 20 years. He and I still get together, he retired a couple years ago. And I would ask him, I'd sit down, he talked about all the people he had hired. He fired one play-by-play -play guy who was a long time NBA voice for like 30 years and fired him unceremoniously because the guy had gotten too big for his britches and had brought in a uh, had brought in a, an agent and the agent asked for too much and so I well there's the binoculars too so I forgot about that another weapon don't forget binoculars yeah those are important all oh, that, that might be the most important always have go invest that's the first thing you do you've got to have binoculars good a good pair uh, don't get any cheapies those are those are critical but uh, anyway, so yeah, so I, I uh, asked him what made a good broadcaster in his mind. And it's a lot of subjectivity. Now, you could be fired at a moment's notice if somebody doesn't like your personality or, or your style. But he said, I want whoever is listening to a game or watching a Chicago Bulls game, when we are, especially at home, I want the listener or the viewer at some point during that game to say, Man, I'd love to be there. Something's going on. I want to be there. And I do this naturally, thankfully, when I'm at a game. Because I want to be there. And I am there. And especially when the team is, is things are going well and exciting. And there's always a story to tell. And even if the team's not performing well, I look around that ballpark at PNC Park. And I see just so many great sights. Kids with their parents, kids on dates. Uh, they open up a new area out in right center field, the landing, uh, Fatheads bar out in left center field. I've been around every seat in the ballpark. I know the, the, the beauty of, of Pittsburgh is, is shown going into any seat. So no matter the score, no matter the situation, uh, you should want to be there. But of course, the, the critical thing is that game. And uh, so I have a natural enthusiasm for that. And he kind of reinforced that when he told me that. And I think about that a lot, that, in fact, Mike Lang had a, sign, had a saying, uh, when, when the Penguins are going good, and a good game, shame on you for six weeks if you're not here tonight. So, or you would have to be here to believe it, which was a line that my broadcast partner in Buffalo used, Van Miller, a lot. Uh, be conversational. Again, a fine line here. You want to enunciate you want to be strong with your words, conviction. Uh, don't use a lot of apostrophes. It's a one nothing game, it's not one nothing. You are a professional broadcaster. Act like it, talk like it. That doesn't mean you can't be colloquial. You can't have some sayings. You can't once in a while say, boy, pirates could use a hit. Right now, they ain't hitting. That's okay. To, to be laid back, but your emphasis should be on and uh, your most important goal for a broadcast is to be professional, enunciate clearly. Unfortunately, I have over these many years emailed on occasion text with would-be, wannabe broadcasters who are oftentimes high schoolers, sometimes college, sometimes beyond college. I had a, one time I was at a party, Christmas party, my brother's out in Collier Township. Big crowd, winter, snowing, and a lot of people there, and this older woman came up to me and scolded me, I want to talk to you. And this big crowd, I said, okay. So we, we go out actually to in the balcony and it's snowing. And, and she says, my son should have your job, okay? Uh, he knows more statistics, more about baseball and every sport than you do. Way more. Good for him. What's he do for a living? He said he's in pharmaceuticals. Okay? Did he go to school for this? No. Didn't go to school for broadcasting? How old is he? 30. But he still should be in the And I didn't discount it. I said, well, 
is he willing to drop everything and go to Des Moines, Iowa? Is he willing to drop everything, go to Bradford, PA, go to Erie, Pennsylvania, go to Mechanicsburg, PA, drop everything, go to Huntington, go, uh, is he willing to go to Oshbach, Oshkosh, Wisconsin? She goes, what are you talking about? So wait, is he, no, he needs to be a, there's a station right now in Pittsburgh, ESPN, they're 24 hour radio sports. That's where he wants to go. That, that's, then you don't want to be a broadcaster. So I do get some people reaching out to me, especially in the winter time, say, I'll do anything. I want to do, I want to do what you do. And I will go and have, sit there, have a cup of coffee. And unfortunately, probably more often than not, I am amazed at the level of serenity, uh, apathy probably a better word, not just in broadcasting, but in life. I tell this people all the time, I want to reach across the table. And these are, could be 15 to 25 year olds I want to reach across the table and grab them by the lapel and shake them and say, oh, hello, like, are you alive? Wake up. <laughs> you want to be an announcer? Do you, do you want to live? Like, do anything. So, in terms of announcing, uh, you better have some natural enthusiasm and want to. Otherwise, do something else. You want to, you, want to, you know, go behind the counter and do something? That's fine. But uh, my first priority is to be enthusiastic about life and really enthusiastic about broadcasting and show that enthusiasm uh, when you're on the air. The thing about baseball and sports is that even if you lose, and people say, how do you do it? You, you've been an announcer for, I don't know, somebody told me, I've been doing this my 29th year and I guess 25 of them have been losing seasons, which is probably a record in the history of sports. And how do you do it? Well, I don't go to the game tonight thinking about how off our record is, how many games out we are. I go to the game tonight thinking when Mitch Keller, I believe, is pitching tonight, what a story this guy is. What an incredible story he is about perseverance. It, it reflects life that they were giving up on him. And Pittsburgh Pirates fans criticize the Pirates for letting all these guys go over the years, and they always get better. And here we go again. Mitch Keller's terrible and everybody wanted him out of town. And why do you keep pitching him? Well, he found a way. And he's gotten better and better. And he's been one of the best pitchers maybe in the National League since the All-Star break. That story, the Red Sox are coming to town. They haven't come to Pittsburgh since 2014. The history of these two teams. They played in the first ever World Series. Playoffs in sports. The Super Bowl is because of the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Boston Red Sox. Think of that history. 1903, Super Bowl doesn't exist unless the owner of the Pirates and the owner of the Red Sox decide, you know what, it's not good enough that we Pirates were winners last year in our National League and that you, Boston Americans, now the Red Sox, were the winners of the American League. I bet you we could make even more money if we added a playoff. How about we do a best of nine World Series and we'll take the money, the gate. And that's what they did. That led to the players ears perking up and finding out, wait a minute, these owners just got more money because they made us play all these games. Where's our money? So the history of those negotiations have gone on forever. So the, the point of that is that winning is great. It tops everything. It makes it easy. I, I've said oftentimes, you could put you know, you know, a, a monkey in, in the seat of a, of a broadcast booth and when you're winning, you'd still get great ratings. It's when you're losing, when it really is tough. When, it, when you work, that's when you work at it. 13, 14, 15, those years for me were the least busy. People didn't bother me much because they thought I was so busy. Oh, Pirates are winning, I won't bother Greg. Actually. It's like cruise control. No matter what you say, nobody's worried about what you say. You're not offending anyone. Um, so the winning is great, but my favorite singular moment as a pirate broadcaster, as a sports broadcaster, it was broadcasting the Buffalo Bills, Houston Oilers 
In the 1989 wild card game, the greatest comeback in the history of the National Football League, uh, they beat the Houston Oilers down 33 to 3 at halftime. Uh, that was the singular greatest sporting event I've ever broadcast. For me, the greatest baseball broadcast, growing up, a Pirate fan myself, John Wainer, who grew up in Carrick, also a great Pirate fan. I got to know him when he was coming up through the minor league system. He and I became pretty good friends in Buffalo while he was there. And then he became a baseball player for the Pirates, uh, spent about 10 years in the big leagues, released once in a while, never played regularly, hit a total of four home runs in his entire major league career. He was given the honor of playing the final game ever in the history of Three River Stadium, October 1st, 2000 in front of 60,000 people at uh, Three River Stadium to watch the final game ever in that historic stadium. And John Wainer, of all people, is in the starting lineup. What a great touch of class that was by our manager at the time, Gene Lamont. And I went down to the clubhouse and saw John, shook his hand, and I had goosebumps talking to him about this moment for him. Growing up in Carrick, Pennsylvania, a fan of all the sports, and I'm gonna play the last game ever at Three River Stadium, and, and he is so, uh, humble. He, he, he kind of chuckled. He goes, yeah, they, they told me I should try to hit a home run. And we laughed because he, he never hit home runs. He never played. But he started that day. And I go up into the TV booth and I'm, I'm doing a play-by-play -play with Steve Lass and they brought Nellie King back into the booth. Nellie King was a longtime pirate broadcaster who in 1975 was fired alongside Bob Prince. It was national news. People, many people never got over it. But we brought Nellie back to reminisce about the great decade of the 70s with Steve Lass. Pirates are down a couple of runs in the sixth inning, two outs. Still a raucous crowd, even though they're trailing the Chicago Cubs. John Wainer comes to the plate, and in the middle of a story, Steve and, and Nellie are kind of reminiscing, and all of a sudden this pitch is delivered by John Lieber of the Chicago Cubs, and players tell me about moments that they've had. I've heard Bill Mazeroski say, when he hit that home run to win the World Series in 1960 against the Yankees, it's almost like time stood still. And as big of a crowd, he almost couldn't hear the crowd. He floated on air around the bases. Well, as this pitch is being delivered, and I'm listening to their stories, I'm doing the play-by-play, -play, I see John swing the bat, and I see the ball take off. And in a moment in time, for me, time stood still. Because my good friend, I know his history, I know what a terrible life he grew up with. I mean, he admits even today, he should be dead or he should be in jail by sheer luck. He went to school at Indiana, got drafted by the Pirates, his hometown team, had a great career. But I see this ball leaving what looks like a home run, and, and it leaves the ballpark, and I lose it. Uh, and, and watch John run around the bases. And to this day, it's, it's the most incredible moment I've ever, ever seen. This guy who never hits home runs, hits a home run, the last ever in the history of Three River Stadium. Anybody else? Yes, cool. Yeah, you know, I think the best advice for me is because I did all those sports, and I don't know that I took, I wish someone had told me about this, because I was on my own, it was all of a sudden thrust into all these sports, uh, was don't do too much. Uh, you know, get the basics down. Get the basics down. Don't feel like you have to fill every second on air. Just get those basics down. And rely on your eyes. Just rely, you know, what a wonderful feeling to think, you know, when I go, I'm not playing. I'll describe what I see. And that's, and that's really all you can ask. Do it with uh, authority. Don't, I would also say too, I have heard announcers over the years Maybe stumble, it's going to happen. You're going to stumble over words. You're going to make a mistake. The tendency is to, 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 to make that mistake. Uh, you know, number 53, uh, Donnie Edwards goes out. Uh, 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 sorry, 42, uh, that was Tim Beebe. You know, you want to be correct, but you don't have to correct yourself immediately. This happened to me the other day when, uh, back to the question about the statistics, Someone gave me a wrong fact about a stat. Five RBI game for Brian Reynolds, initially read first Pirate since 1974 to have a five RBI game. And I said that. I said, well, wow, that's a long time. I just said, we talked a little bit about it. A couple hours later, I see 
they respond, no, that's just for outfielders. So that was wrong. And to boot, Brian Reynolds was the designated hitter that day. I want to get on the phone to this person and say, you know, thank you, but he's not outfield today, he's the DH. And, but there were two others, two other position players, Freddie Sanchez and Francisco Cervelli, who had five RBIs in San Francisco. And so the point is, later on, next out, came back, and just gradually, casually said, by the way, earlier I must have misspoke. Brian Reynolds, though a big day, five RBIs for anybody, it's the most by an outfielder. There were two other players since 1974, Francisco Cervelli and Freddy Sanchez, who also had five RBIs. Here's the pitch. So don't make a big deal out of mistakes. Oftentimes, move on. And I'll do that now. I'll move on, right, Bernie? That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.